Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 2nd, 2016, a whole new year and the beginning of the 10th season of the TDD Report. I started back in 2007 on live video and I believe around 2009 brought it to YouTube. So um, the show was not a regular production for the first few years. It was just sporadic, but then became a weekly show under request of my viewers. Also, this morning, uh, I stopped by Schumburg Amateur Radio Club and took a test for my amateur license and passed without ever having studied. Uh, I'm going to put this picture up. My friend Jim Dooley uh, photoshopped a really cool picture here of me. I guess if I would have been in my 1930s style ham shack, really cool picture. So uh, thank you, Jim Dooley, for, for putting that together. So now on to the news since I've been away for a week taking a break. Some of this is going to be a little bit older news, but hope it's interesting. This is first from Tech Insider. This shows you um, Tim Berners-Lee at the CERN Research Center uh, and his putting together of the first web page on the uh, World Wide Web. So uh, I'll just show you what this picture looks like. I mean, basically, it's just a bunch of links, and then it talks about the very first search engine, which I did not even know this very search engine. The very first search engine was called Oliweb. Oliweb was the first search engine, was part of a project at CERN in 1993. The project was created by Martigen Koster, one of the web's original architects. And here I'll show you a picture of that. And then they also, if you want to scroll down, you can see a picture of what the Bloomberg uh, financial website looked like back in 1993. And I guess if you wanted to subscribe to it, it costs you $24,000 a year to get financial news and updates from the Bloomberg website if you cared to join. But kind of interesting stroll back into history. And since it's the beginning of a new year, sometimes a little bit of nostalgia is kind of cool. From space.com, and I've talked about this um, as far as the... Uh, other landing that they had, which was, um, what was that called, Blue Horizons or Blue One? What was it called? The, well, anyway, this is from the Falcon X. The Falcon X spaceship actually took off, went into orbital flight, launched some satellites, and then after that came down for a successful landing. That's the one that I'd shown you pictures of before where it accidentally uh, didn't quite do the landings on the barge. Well, this time, after going through the uh, complete space flight, being successful, complete orbital flight, whereas in the case of uh, Blue Origin, uh, their spacecraft, all it was was just basically a test flight. It was suborbital. All they did was just launch it up to where it reached space and then come down to do the landing. So they made it a little bit easy on themselves. But, yeah, it was kind of cool, especially because of the fact that uh, Elon Musk thought it was a failure because when he went outside to watch the craft land, he heard the sonic boom, and he thought the craft had actually blown up. But it landed successfully right on the dime. And there's some pictures at space.com. Some uh, Somebody did some long exposure pictures, which is really cool. You just see a, a big streak of it um, trailing up into the sky and then coming back down for the landing so if you get a chance to check out the pictures but uh, very good now we have two different private space firms um, SpaceX and Blue Origin that both have rockets that have launched and successfully touched down quite a bit difference in the cost too because I guess the booster cost sixteen million dollars but the fuel only cost two hundred thousand dollars so if you can reuse that sixteen million dollar part then you know you end up not having to build that every time just to refill it with two hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, fuel and uh, oh by the way the first websites one with the um, the CERN thing that was from uh, my friend Bob H thank you for that and this next one is from my friend Tom maybe Thomas 8 airbag helps Olympic ski champion mayor avoid major injury that must be his name um, I'm not really familiar I'm not a, into skiing or anything like that but the uh, crash system that he's wearing is pretty good too evidently it can detect changes in motion enough so that it said uh, well, it says right here, the Australian, the Austrian lost control on the SAS long course and spun around flying down the hill backward in midair before he landed on his right side. The airbag vest under his race suit inflated and softened his landing. A crash can never be something favorable, International Ski Federation technical expert Gunter Hujara said, but maybe we have seen here he was saved from a spine injury today. Not a lot of skiers want to wear it because it's a little bit more bulky and when you're talking about tenths or hundreds of a second to be able to win a championship, I guess, unless they make it mandatory, you're probably still not going to see a lot of skiers being willing to uh, wear it. But this is some nice technology that could probably translate to motorcycles. I remember before, I think it was Navy Thomas that sent me in the thing where you had the airbag that would deploy. If you went flying off your motorcycle, you would actually be tethered to your motorcycle 
And uh, then if you went flying off, the tether would actually pull loose and inflate the airbags to uh, allow you a somewhat softer landing. And uh, evidently it took quite a bit. I took over 40 pounds of force, so you wouldn't like accidentally get off your motorcycle and then forget that you were tethered to it. You're not going to accidentally pull too hard and deflate it, not unless you're going to pull with 40 pounds of force, which is quite significant. So um, this one evidently just uses movement detection to be able to deploy the airbag. Much uh, simpler situation. You don't have to deal with a tether and stuff like that. And this last one from United Press International. Super strong lightweight metal could build tomorrow's spacecraft. Um, they have been working on infusing nanoparticles into metals, but what they found is they haven't been able to distribute them evenly enough. And uh, I even found a... Uh, a little typo in this, and uh, so I'll read a little bit of this new metal, a combination of magnesium and ceramic silicone carbide nanoparticles is promising to change how airplanes, spacecraft, and cars are manufactured. Um, here's, here's the paragraph they got wrong. It's the third paragraph down. Researchers say that the metal may be just the first of many groundbreaking manufacturing materials. That's because they've invented a new technique for infusing metals without nanoparticles without hurting the metal's structural integrity. And then if you read on, you can see obviously they miss word. It should be a um, new technique for infusing medical metals with nanoparticles because that's the whole thing. They are, they're able to infuse them evenly. So that's a typo that they didn't catch. I notice it's getting worse and worse as I'm catching these articles. I'm able to type read them and proofread them and uh, uh, I don't know why. They just don't bother to correct them sometime. But yeah, if they can get this technology down and get lighter weight metals going, then uh, all the much better. I mean, uh, every pound saved that you don't have to blast up in orbit is a, you know, a pound of something else you can either take along or you can go farther with the same amount of fuel or uh, use less fuel to start with. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.